Hi folks, this is uh, International Master John Watson and this is Ask the Master on ICC TV. The main idea of this show is to provide players with the forum to ask questions about chess or any sort of chess topic and the chess world, anything about the chess world, chess books, uh, chess videos, uh, chess openings, openings are a specialty here. Also, um, anything about, hey, you can send me your games, and I'm not sure if I'll always show them, but if you do send me your games, please have them, try to uh, have them be thematic so they'll be interesting to somebody else, have a question that's associated with it, that would be nice, or um, if it's got a particular part of the game that's more interesting, I might just use part of it, you know, like the ending, or the middle game, or even the opening, if that's particularly unique. So um, those are the kind of questions you can ask. Um, now the way to do these questions is I can receive them beforehand by email. That's usually the best way. Ask I am Watson at chessclub.com. Uh, that's A S K I M W A T S O N at chessclub.com. That chessclub.com is C H E S S C L U B. You can also send them, you can message me if you're an ICC member on John L. Watson, L as in Lion, so J-O-H-N-L-W-A-T-S-O-N. And a good way to do, the, do it is to chat right now. I see we've got a couple people on the chat already, so that's cool. And we've been having some really good chat input uh, back and forth recently, so that, that's a really good way to do this. Um, so, and you can go to my... Uh, Facebook page, John L. Watson. You might want a friend request me. I just changed that if you need to uh, on the timeline. And you can see previous shows and what we've covered in terms of openings. Um, so a lot of people like to do that because they like to see when some opening or other was covered. Okay, so today I'm going to do something different. Um, I haven't done this before, but I didn't get any opening questions or new games this week. Uh, so it's a good chance to show some other material, including an end game that I just got from somebody, and uh, I was also thinking about showing some studies or problems. So this may be more a little like a lecture than usual, but in between those presentations, I'll be addressing chat questions and comments as usual. So if they're interesting enough, we probably won't get too far into the end game or studies. But, um, but if not, I think I'll get started with one of them. Here we've got some people coming in. Um, one comment first about last week's chat. I was asked about a book for a white repertoire against the French. It's amazing how many French books, most chess books are written from the standpoint of a, either a complete repertoire for white or um, a very specialized repertoire for some particular kind of opening. Uh, and I would say a majority of them are from the black point of view. So for example, with the French defense, you have I think, 30 books or something for, from the black point of view repertoire for black and uh, very few from the white point of view. Most times from the white point of view you want to look into a book that's a 1E4 repertoire. And with that in mind I did mention the Yevseyev book with the Tarash, uh, Knight D2. Let me, um, could put that up there. Anyway, the Tarash with Knight D2, you can go back and look at last week's show. Uh, he gives a repertoire with C3. Uh, it's a fairly simple repertoire. You play C3 almost, every, um, almost after everything after 392. I also mentioned the uh, Parmesan, pa, Paramarjan Neji's uh, book on 1E4, his 1E4 repertoire book, and he gives three knight C3, but he's all main lines, very, very complicated, very, very tactical, so it's not going to be of much use to most of you. Uh, and has to be kept up with and updated all the time anyway. So I'm not so sure about that. The book I didn't mention is the best book on the Tarash. I would recommend the Tarash because it's a little simpler uh, and safer. And it's called um, How to Beat the French Defense. It's by Andreas Zermiadanos. Uh, that's T-Z-E-R-M-I-A-D-A-N-O-S. It's an everyman book from 2008. It's uh, 316 pages. It's a nice repertoire. Uh, but not too difficult to play and learn. It was written in 2008, as I say, and, but it's still relevant in most lines. Uh, so you'll need to update a little bit, but it's a good start. And I also wanted to mention the online video by Lawrence Trent on the website chess24.com. He also did a Tarash repertoire, and it's really excellent. It's really well done. It's, of course, less detailed because it's a video and not a super long video. Okay. Um, it's a video series though, so it's, it's plenty, it's got a fair amount of detail. Okay, let me see what we've got here. Okay, no questions yet, and that's good, because I wanted to get to uh, the thing that's in front of you on the screen here. 
I got this question about this ending, and I think it's really typical in many ways, and therefore instructive. In other words, you, things don't, you usually don't get endings that are just very straightforward and involve just one principle and then everything follows. So the question was, uh, should white win this ending? I have the feeling that this is the person who played it as white. I have the feeling I should have won it, but I haven't found anything definite yet. So I've looked at this quite a bit, and uh, helped by the computer, of course, <laughs> which makes it a lot easier. And in many ways, it's one of those endings that shows how calculation can be as important or more important than, um, than principles in the end game, although both are obviously important. In fact, chess principles apply probably more in the end game, standard chess principles, than they do to other, any other part of the game. So let's just see. Let's just go through this a little bit. Um, okay, let's just make the first move. It's Black's move. White just played C. Oh, excuse me. I'm. Hang on. I'm on the wrong page here. Give me one second. Okay, here we go. So um, Black just moved in my example. It was like this. White just played C5, uh, and Black move over. Let me get this right. Okay, and white advances. It's hard to see any other plan. And black comes over. The idea is divert black's king and then attack these weak pawns. That's sort of the first thing white, really the only plan white really has, unless he can win this pawn. Okay, so white advances. Now it looks like another pretty good try is to just advance the pawn. The king chases it and then go and try to win this pawn. And that comes very close, but really not quite. Now, now White really, black really shouldn't give him this pawn. It's just really too important. So he should come back and give him this pawn instead. But covering that is important to stop white from getting past pawns. And um, at this point, white might play there, advancing, attacking the bishop. The bishop might come down to try and win the d pawn. And uh, now that this move, knight f5 check, is an issue, keeping the king out. So white stops that and wins a pawn. And black, I think, simply takes that pawn. No, actually, this is interesting. Yeah, he can do it either way, but the easiest way is this. He should just take that. And black, it turns out, is okay here. White enters in on these squares, so it's clear that white has the only winning chances, uh, even a pawn down, but it just doesn't turn out to be quite good enough. Um, this move, for example, is now in a, not good enough because you're attacking the knight, and it has no really good squares to go to. And if it goes there, you have this nice move, e6 check followed by takes, unless black takes, in which case white wins this piece and has one pawn left. So, so that would be one win. Um, and let me just show you, okay, so we're talking about c7, uh, king d7, and bishop d5, and knight h6, and king here, bishop down, and knight takes to stop knight f5 check, bishop takes is the main move, king up, Still looks kind of dangerous, but it just turns out that this move knight g4 is very, very nice. Because after taking here, you have this move knight f2. And, and either, either this pawn becomes important, also this knight covers the idea, it has this idea right away of winning the f pawn. And I don't know if I want to go into more detail because we could spend all day on this ending, but I think you can see. Let me just try this. This move is an interesting move to try to get e6 in and just uh, just bring the bring the pawn in. But black just in time has that move. And um, and then if white goes here, hoping to still bring this in to stop the pawn, then black will have a timely knight e4 check and you'll get an ending. <laughs> and it's a little hard to describe, but that's well. Let's do it. Let's do it real fast. Let me see. It would be um, it would be h3, e6. H2, E7, uh, check, takes, takes, queens. And the queen and the knight seem to collaborate well, but it just turns out this really can't be won if black defends well. Um, just black has just enough room with this king to play around with. So that really wouldn't quite work, but it's very, very close. So instead of that, white plays um, this move, which turns out to be a really good move. And black still has to come over and try to attack on the queen side. So that was good insight to play knight c5, because now you can play bishop d5 anyway, and the pawn isn't hanging yet. And so black plays the knight back, the idea being to attack this and to attack this pawn here. And white takes it. So now we're white is a pawn up temporarily, but this one's going to fall. And black plays here to defend this so that he can take this, for example. And um, 
white plays now this move, and it's very interesting, this kind of thing. You have to decide how you want to try and win these things, and frankly, I don't, I mean, I really doubt if I'd won, I would have won this endgame. It's just too, too many accurate moves have to be made, including that knight c5 move. And this is just so logical to put the bishop there and then try to wipe out the kingside pawns. But it turns out that black has ways to defend now. And there was a way to win. If white had had enough time, you've got to remember white's short of time too, which most of us are by the time we get to this point of the game, uh, that that move actually wins. And it's worth kind of taking a look, look at that. Now one thing, one thing that's maybe instructive first off is after these moves, um, now, let's just take this. It turns out, if, okay, well, let me real quick describe this. If, if the king comes up, then white's going to march in on the king's side. And that's good enough here. Because what happens is that black can't really do much. And I'm um, not even sure if that was the right way to do it. But you can see he's going to come to this square. And then there's just too much pressure. White will win some material. Okay, um, it's a little more complicated than that, but I'm not going to... I'm not going to go into that because that just intuitively looks wrong, doesn't it? So what black would do is take this um, pawn here and white plays here. And this position I think is interesting because it's a case of bishop versus knight where it's not just pawns on the same side of the board, it's kind of split pawns. Now they're not, if the pawns are very split, that will, the bishop will usually win pretty easily. But even this distance is probably enough to win and especially in this case because the king has a path into the king's side. Without the path, I'm not so sure. But with bishop versus knight and the path into the king's side, this should be a win. And let me just show you an example of that. Knight comes back, bishop comes up, um, king moves. I think black has a few, doesn't have many plans here. Black checks. Um, here has to come back again, king comes up. And really black has to sort of waste time here for a while and hope that there's no really blast through move here because he wants to use his, his H pawn. In fact, he probably starts right away. Well, if he starts right away, it's quite easy because of just the check. And then you just come back and take the pawn because it can't advance. So that's easy. But the H pawn is still a threat. So black just wastes time here. Black just plays, I think, king d8. And white finally cashes in and takes this pawn. Still close but not quite good enough. Just king f7 here. In fact, I think is h4. Yeah, h4 is forced. So um, f5 will win too. That's probably the easiest way to do this. Um, f6, h2. So you get an end game here. So black does manage to queen, but it's going to be two pawns because there's going to be a check somewhere followed by taking this pawn at the very least. And then you have two passed pawns and that'll win. Even queen versus queen, that'll win. Even with the, you know, it's eventually the king escapes checks. So that's kind of an interesting little line. And um, there's a similar one with king f8. I don't want to, I don't want to. So anyway, this, this check is the first thing we're looking at. Oh yeah, so if he ignores that knight, that's the other way to do it. Let me just really quick show you kind of how this might go. It's the same theme. The, the theme is that the king can penetrate. Just go here and then sneak over here. And um, that may seem obvious at first, but it's actually very, very, very close. Because even though white wins this pawn, there's the stupid h pawn that's a problem. For example, right here, and white takes, and it just turns out that this is enough to win. Actually, I don't think this is enough to win. <laughs> this, this reminds me of a line that didn't work. So let me see. Uh, let me see if that's right. Aha. Okay, well now we're in something kind of interesting. Let me see here. Okay. Oh, we've got some questions coming in, so that's good. But let me just finish this one off first. We have, uh, very interesting. Let me see what if I, my notes say here. King F7. Mm. Okay, so we're, we're back at uh, King G5. Just follow my own analysis here for a second. Bishop F5, Bishop. Oh, you can play E6 first instead of Bishop takes G6. Ah, oh, I see. Sorry, okay, so after... Um, yeah, the king shouldn't be... Okay, that's why. This is too easy. I was wondering why this was so easy looking. Uh, let's go back for a second. I see six, king, g5. Okay. Oh, he plays, okay, got it, finally got it here, I think. 
F5, captures, 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 here, and E6, making sure that you can queen that pawn, basically. Uh, King D6, I'm just making sure of this, King F7, H3, now why would this win for, for sure? Okay, this one wins because that pawn will win by itself. Okay, you just have your, this is sort of one of those take my word for it things. Uh, let me see, I can make a few more moves, but um, basically you chase the king away somewhere and start pushing your pawn. And this guy, this is a win. This is a book win. It takes some work, but it does, it does win. Um, and I just, I don't know how to prove that. Something like this, you just play here. And pretty soon he has problems running out of uh, checks. Maybe this king shouldn't even be here, come to think of it. But anyway, this is something they probably win. So anyway, let's go back to the game. So he should have played knight e6 check. The game went like this. And that's certainly a logical move. Now it turns out black could draw with this move, and it would be a lot easier than what happens in the game. And it's hard to describe that. It's just sort of a matter of sort of concrete. It allows the king to come into the center really quickly is what it amounts to. And then it's fairly, fairly easy. Black played here and gave white another chance. But it just shows how important calculation is here. Okay, so now white starts moving in according to the original plan of zooming into the center here. And all of the moves for black, by the way, lose. That's fairly obvious, but this is a very nice idea. This king c5 idea works really nicely. Um, now this didn't work. Let me just show you the rest of the game. The rest of the game was pretty simple. It's just like that. And I think he stopped there you know, very soon check and they took a draw here because black there's no way to make progress after king f5 but it's very interesting that in a real game you'd probably win here if you played this move it's just that black has a miracle defense and the defense is here uh, everything else loses um, you can imagine why the king basically just penetrates uh, king up king c3 see all of a sudden there's this counter attack and after takes takes now white should play this move it's very easy if this this sequence is very easy. So he should actually advance his pawn. And then black goes ahead and plays back, and white plays f5. And uh, anyway, you get to a point where white's got a, white, white has an extra pawn, but because black has counterplay with this pawn, uh, the, he can't, white can't queen his extra pawn in time. And that's drawn. So a very interesting endgame, and uh, sorry to take so long on that. Well, thank you with E6. You're absolutely right. I kind of noticed that on the side of my eye, but I was trying to follow my actual annotation that E6 won very quickly. Um, okay, so before I get to the next question uh, or the next thing I'm going to talk about, let's go to the chat and start doing some stuff. Thank you, Jim, for the E6 thing, because you're absolutely right. Okay, Ready Gambit. Um, registered Gambit against French and go Ready Gambit. Okay, the Ready Gambit, as I recall, it has other names too. Is uh, let me let me start a new board. In fact, let me get yeah no I don't even have a board here so let me do um, let me just do this one. Usually I have a game up and it's easy to go back to the first position. Whoops, almost. Okay. Yeah, the ready gambit it has to do with giving up a pawn in the opening to get um, to get good play. Uh, this just isn't working. I will make this work in one second. I promise. Sorry. All right, ready gambit. Which one is that? That's uh, D takes E. Okay, this is the Alapin to go to do this way, followed by knight D2, for example. The ready is, which one is the ready? Uh, maybe you want to show me this, which one the ready is. I've actually kind of forgotten. Do you know the exact order? See, the person that asked that. Uh, Tywin, could you ask me, ask me that? I've kind of forgotten which one the ready is. Just can't remember. Can, if you could throw that in there, that would really help. Or if anybody else knows. Um, otherwise, I'll go to the next question. I, I'm sorry, I just can't remember which one the ready is. I know it's a pawn sacrifice. I just can't. Maybe it's in the winnower? 
Oh, oh, it's uh, wait, the red. Yeah, sometimes I think it refers to this, but that's and that's a gambit if black plays here and here. Now black's a pawn ahead, so it's probably this one. I think that's the one. You might want to confirm that. Tie one. And I always think black's just fine here. And one of the ideas is to play g4, but you have to decide whether to play queen e2 first. And I think, I think it might be better to play g4 first. Well, they, they, both of them can be played. One thing about having the um, now maybe queen e2 is safer. If you play g4 right away, I think putting the knight here and just giving the pawn back is pretty easy for black. Something like that, and maybe even maybe even an h6 idea. I think an h6 idea is pretty good here, as I recall. And the point is, is that it looks like white might be able to, now we're threatening that, and we're also threatening to just attack it again. And if he plays there, I think the idea is just play very solidly here, or chase that away. And black has a nice advantage in the center here, and he's doing well in terms of development, so even though that looks like a cramping pawn, white, I, think, I think you'll find black's better there. I wouldn't be surprised if that isn't better for black too, just with a big center. You've got that f4 square, you have e5. You might want to look that up, but I think that's true. So maybe they play queen e2. And maybe black just plays knight c6 again because of the idea about playing knight here. White takes. And there's a nice move for black involving a5, maybe, maybe something like this. And if castles, which is the original idea, you play a5 here. Just with the idea of attack. And if he plays a4, then you're going to swing that knight over to one of these squares. It's very easy to play for black. Oops, not there because of bishop g7. But I think this is pretty easy. Probably just castles first. Oh, this is in the g4. Okay, that's if he plays g4, you can. You, this is a, a good position. And if not, I think it's just a normal position. This is just equal. Um, g4 is more common then. That's the whole point. g4 is more common than knight takes. So what what usually does something? I think, but that doesn't make sense because knight d4 being so strong. So that would be horrible. Um, anyway, what do you think? You can give me a line that you think is better. He says, yep, that one. Uh, this line now is obviously very good. So I guess g4 is the only, the only real try for white here that is really dramatic. And as I say, I think this line turns out to be quite, quite sound and quite solid. And then I, I, if I remember right, h6, you may have other moves here. Obviously, it doesn't, you must be okay anyway, but I think this is a particularly nice move. Obviously, if white takes that, look at that, you've got the weak. Black's better developed. That's weak. These squares are hanging. So um, I've always liked black in these positions, but it could be that white's equal. Pretty harmless. I mean, at best you get equality after about four or five moves. That's not putting much pressure on black. But you can play it. It's definitely playable. I think it's called Ready Pap. That's right. Ready slash Pap. P-A-P-P, -P -P, because he played it a lot. Okay. What do you think of the Halloween game? We'll take a look at that in a second. Uh, let me scroll up here. Oh, my scroll bar is gone. This has happened to me before. Let me, let me do that. Let, let's try and go in order here. Okay, up at the top. Registered. I learned a line against the candidate master level player in the burn version of Pearson. He didn't play his usual line. He played C3, transposing into an Alp in Sicilian, which he knows well. I don't. Yeah, that doesn't seem right, because the burn variation of the, the Pearson, which I recommend in my uh, lecture series, you ICC people know, is to play um, bishop g5. So I don't know how this gets into an There's no C3. So if you wanted a c3, you'd have to play it in some other order. Uh, let's think about that. If you wanted a c3, you'd have to play this first, and you wouldn't play a burn. Okay? So I don't think you should get into an elf in Sicilian. This is the only way you're going to get a c3 move in. Maybe not immediately, but soon. Um, but you can ask the question more specifically with a specific move order. I probably just misunderstand you. And if not, we can. And you can also send me an email about it. Remember that. Okay. Oh, here's the line. Okay, it takes a bishop d3. Exactly. Okay, so now I see that. Hang on. But that has nothing to do with a, a burn variation. Um, I see, 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 c5, c3. Yeah, you can play c5 instead of g6. It's not much of a pierce at this point, but sure. And, um, hmm. This play looks playable for black c5. I'm not, I'm not sure. I don't know. I suppose taking an e5 could, could be kind of critical. Uh, anyway, c3 is, is safe. Knight c6, well, maybe. d5. Is there a better line for black in that transposition? Well, sure, you can play your g6 move anyway, here, for example. Um, this is a little bit uh, provocative. 
I don't know why, but that just doesn't look right to me. Maybe the bishop just retreats. You know, white can't, black can't take that because of check. And you start chasing the knights back. I'd be a little suspicious of this. I'm not saying it's bad, but I'd be a little suspicious. So I agree with you that you probably don't want this line. But you can play a number of different ways, I imagine. Um, G6 is so natural. Um, maybe someone else has an idea, too. And of course, you don't have to play C5 if they play bishop D3. You can play G6 immediately. You can play E5. That's a that's a very standard move because the bishop's sort of not coordinating with D4. So I would look into those things. Okay, what else do we have here? We have... Um, there are only two good gambits of the queens in Mecco Gambit. I don't believe that. <laughs> but we'll... Uh, We've shown good gambits here, a couple other good gambits, but most gambits you write are, are pretty marginal, especially for black, right? When you play gambits as black, you're really risking things. There are quite a few gambits for white, but they're all just kind of equal. King Crusher played the Smith Moore against me, okay. But that was a blitz game, right? He plays online with these really quick games, a rapid game or something. Uh, two wins and a draw. How can I beat the Smith Moore with black? Uh, we've had this question before, I think. Uh, at any rate, I hope I didn't skip anything, by the way, folks. To go, repeat your question, if I've skipped it. Um, Smith Moore, one thing that I wanted to, we recommend in our book, uh, Taming the Wild Chess Openings, and we've recommended this for about 30 years. It's very obscure. Uh, now, of course, you can always play. There are, there's tremendous amounts of analysis online. I'm sorry, maybe I should even, what am I doing? <laughs> uh, my fault, sorry. More, more Gambit. Here's a Smith Moore Gambit here. And you can decline it, of course, but that's not much fun. I mean, if you want to try and get an advantage. If you do accept it, um, you can always play what almost every book recommends, which is this standard line with uh, the, the so-called Taylor defense, where you play like this. And um, you can look that up in any number of books. There's a recent repertoire book that, that recommends this and takes the main Mora uh, recommendations and sort of refutes them, or tries to refute them. And um, Black has a bunch of ideas, but one of them is very simple, just to play there and maybe even play bishop here, followed by even pawn to e5. Very solid position. And just aim for d4, work on d4. But it's very, it's complicated, and uh, bishop g5 is probably the main line. Um, the two books on the Mora that are the most famous now are Langrock's second edition, Hannes Langrock, and the Esserman book, Mark Esserman book. So you'll want to look at what they recommend, but they're quite easy to play to find answers. Neither book treats this move well at all. That's why I was thinking about e6, by the way. Neither, move, neither book treats this very well, and I'll show you what, what, what's going on here. Um, Eric and I, Eric Schiller and I, have recommended this for many years. <laughs> it's played by Tim On. <laughs> it's played by some people, and it's a tremendous record. I mean, it's an absolutely amazing record, in turn, in all, including performance rating. It's not just that Black wins a lot of games because he's the better player. It's also um, very good. And of course, it, it looks horrible. It looks risky because of the dark squares. For example, even this right away looks like a problem. But you can just play d5 for one thing. Um, and um, anyway, you might check out our book, uh, Taming the Wild Chess Openings, or any, any earlier book we have from way back where we recommended this. You can look it up online. I think we may have done an earlier, we did do an earlier lecture with this. Uh, Black's idea is just to keep developing. He can play either here or even this immediately is a nice move, d6 sort of covering these squares and waiting with the knight to decide where to go. And uh, it's a kind of a silly move. It's sort of sitting out there in the middle of nowhere. It just doesn't look right. It's got that, and that, that's what's fun about it. And may, maybe it shows something about the mora. You've got the two center pawns to one right away, and you're a pawn up, so maybe you can afford to make moves that don't quite look right. I think you'd, I think you'd enjoy it. Okay, let me scroll down. Um, why is it this won't scroll down for me? I hate it when it does that. Uh, have you heard about the Chicago defense? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not thrilled. You might want to look at Esterman's book. It's awfully slow. I'll, I'll show everybody that. Um, Chicago defense. Yeah, I, I looked at this at one point. People were very excited for a little while. I think the main appeal of the Chicago defense is that it looks so cool. <laughs> it would be going here first. White makes his usual setup. Um, there is a knight f6 too, right? Or is it just knight c6? At a6. I don't remember the exact order anymore. Queen e2 is going to happen, right? Um, b5. And rook a7. The idea is rook a7. Often you play rook d7. And then all the sacrifices aren't supposed to work. Um, but you can imagine. Look at, the, look at the leading development. So you want to look at the concrete things. I would not recommend it. Uh, but if you want to really investigate it, look at those Mora books. The ones by Langrock and Esserman. I 
was going to play it or thought about playing it, thought about recommending it in our books, and gave up on it. I thought white was just better and had nice attacking chances. But it's fun. The the rookie seven the rookie seven idea is so much fun. It's just such a great idea. That it, I think I think it's appealing aesthetically. And for a while, of course, no one knew about it. But now they all know about it. Unfortunately, the more players all know about it. I cannot understand my scrolling problem here. Huh. Well, at any rate, if you have more questions, then uh, uh, just keep throwing them on there. If I if I've missed a question because I'm having trouble scrolling as usual. Okay, well, with that break, let me go ahead and get to the next question. Uh, someone asked, and here's a subject I really haven't addressed hardly at all. Do you think endgame studies are useful for amateurs to spend time solving? Do you have a favorite study or study author? So, for the second part about favorite study or study author, I don't know enough about studies to have a real favorite. I'm, uh, I've always been amazed by, I grew up with and have been amazed by the Troitsky studies are super famous, but um, that's kind of an obvious answer, and I don't know, you know if he's the best or anything. I just know that that's the one I, I've seen the most of. And I haven't kept up with modern composers, which may be the best, you know, they may be the best composers, so who knows. Um, but the second part is very interesting. I, I, I Whether endgame studies are useful for the amateur to spend time solving, um, I think, first of all, if they're fun and you wouldn't otherwise study much chess or you're bored by chess, you should definitely go for it. It will improve your game. Just thinking about positions and ideas is, is helpful. And I think I've made that point. If you read a bad book, it's good for you. If you read anything that makes you think and concentrate and try to make, you know, try to understand positions and solve positions is healthy. Uh, but I do think that most other kinds of studying are more useful uh, if they relate to positions you may get over the board or the type of position you may get over the board. I think it's it's better to be close. I, I like to study things that are close to real world situations, but of course that's not always you know th that may not be true. Um, here's a contrary view from Levitt and Friedgood's book, Secrets of Spectacular Chess. Here's a great quote: Will you be will looking at problems and studies? This is I'm quoting now. Actually, help me play better chess. This is a question I've been asked many times. This is Levitt. The answer is yes. If you want to become a stronger player, follow, following the example of Garry Kasparov might have its advantages. Let's hear a few things he's written about this subject. Quote, I'm fond of solving chess problems and particularly chess studies. Chess problems are full of paradoxes and original ideas. There are some studies which I like to play through again and again. And he also says um, that chess composition is the most beautiful and mysterious aspect of the art of chess. It was the beauty and brilliance of tactical blows that captivated me in early childhood chess for me is art, unquote. Now back to Levitt, he says, for those not convinced by the empirical evidence, there are several plausible reasons why looking at chess problems and studies will improve your chess. Firstly, it should enhance the powers of chess fantasy by building up the, quote, vocabulary, unquote, of tactical ideas and patterns. As Kasparov has put it, chess problems are full of paradoxes and original ideas, so even he came across ideas and vocabulary that he had not previously encountered. Uh, secondly, solving problems and studies requires very clear, logical, precise, goal-oriented thinking. Such thinking is very valuable, but not exclusively so when playing chess on any level. Thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, there is the question of motivation. Okay, well, so it's now clear to me that studying ideas that you almost certainly will never see in your lifetime, or, or almost never see, uh, is more useful than studying slightly more conventional ideas. For example, conventional tactics are, there's an infinite number of them that come from real-world positions. So. So studying those is, um, I'm not quite sure why studying completely exotic things with 100 pieces clustered in the middle of the board and the king in the middle of the board and the mate in three, you know, is necessarily more useful. I think it's probably less useful, um, although of course it can't hurt. So maybe motivation is the key, the answer that I tend to agree with. Um, and by the way, I think that problems are more useful, I mean studies are more useful than problems mostly, not always obviously. But uh, and let me show you that. I'm getting a. Uh, I'm actually getting an answer, uh, a question on ICC. That's not a good thing. That's for the future. If Scareth could get onto the YouTube channel, that would work better. I just happened to notice. Thank you for sending this, but this is for the ones that I collect during the week. Maybe I'll take a look at it anyway. But give me give me a second on that one. Let me continue with this. So I so I picked out some problems and studies. We probably won't get to all of them, but let me just show you the difference. First of all, what's the difference between a problem and a study? Um, I, I don't, I, you can go look up the actual, um, 
the actual definition, but basically uh, most problems start with a uh, white to move, move and mate in two or three or four or something, and um, studies don't necessarily have that kind of goal. It's just to, to draw or to win, that kind of thing. That's one of the basic differences. And you'll find that problems tend to be much, in my opinion, tend to be much incredibly artificial, the best problems, because the pieces are just sort of clustered all over the place. Let me try showing you a problem, for example. You know, it's kind of a pretty problem. I, I just saw it actually by coincidence in one of the old Harkness books on American chess problems. And uh, here it is. And, um, you know, I'm not going to ask you to solve this because that's kind of silly. But let me just show you. It's a mate in four. And uh, the first issue is that if, if white, for example, just queens that pawn with check, black goes here and, he, and, and the king has enough room to escape so he can't be mated in four moves. Um, so the first move he makes is this move, but it's getting, ooh, I didn't realize that I wasn't able to get to promote to something else. So let me look at my options. Uh, uh, you know, actually I, I recorded this with a different promotion, but apparently ICC didn't take it. That would be what menu? Anybody know the menu for all settings? Um, plane. Pre-move, always queen. No, I'll take away always queen. This may work. Ah, there we go. The bishop. Well, now it's an automatically bishop. <laughs> but that's because that's what's in the original file. Now, why not queen? Uh, if he takes a queen, what happens is that... Blood, now, that threatens checkmate. For example, threatens this checkmate. Because it cuts off the king's square. But, but black can block that. And then if white takes that, because black wants to go king here, if white takes that, it's stalemate. So instead, he, he promotes to a bishop. And uh, it's a, that's a very pretty solution, but it sort of continues. Black takes. Now, what else can black do? This, this uh, mate is threatened. Um, but if, um, what, what options does he have here? Uh, if rook f6 now, we can simply take that. And that stops, um, that stops king d4. So uh, what would he try? King d6, I guess. And then the easiest thing to do is just go here just move over and come back and then checkmate. It's a pretty little checkmate. Um, so the bishop moves kind of clever, right? Nice little under promotion. That's always fun. But here, the, fun, the most fun part comes with, um, with the main move he makes here. And then white has only one move that wins, and it's this one, <laughs> promoting to another bishop. Again, taking with the queen is a, uh, is a stalemate, of course. Black goes here, only move. White plays another bishop. If he takes, if he if he queens, that's another stalemate. And to me, one reason I'm showing this is uh, so black has to make one more move. That's forced, and then just checkmate. So three straight bishop promotions. I mean, these things are kind of fun, right? I I, I enjoyed this one, but it's not, um, it's not a superb, um, a superb problem in the sense of winning prizes and things like that. What the real point I want to make though is it's unrealistic. It's just you're never going to probably going to only under promote a couple times in your life. You're certainly not going to make three straight under promotions. And this is very typical of a problem, although a lot of times they're much more complicated. But a lot of problems you do, you know, a, a move that makes three interferences at once and pins all your pieces and exposes you to checkmate or something, <laughs> you know, and, and it wins anyway. So um, I tend to like study. Now there are problems that are very useful, but I tend to like studies better. So let me let me show you a study. But I'll get back to the chat first. The chat takes priority. Um, I'm confused by what is the English defense and what is the George? There we go. Chicago defense. White has a poor score in Mega Base. Um, yeah, I can believe that, but usually people who play white in the more uh, are not all that good. And also, it could be the Chicago defense is something. I think the good Mora players are not at all worried about the Chicago defense. So you'd be a little bit, a little bit risky to. I think to do that, to um, to risk it, but um, just not the best defense in my opinion. It's not just an objective thing, I think it's a practical thing too, but if it scores well in practice, you never know. Okay, so um, let me let me see, what are we doing? We're checking b6 and a6. Yeah, he's really got that. The English defense is 1b6. Well, the English defense, properly speaking, let me put a board up again. I usually have a board up. Okay, so the English defense really starts this way and then goes to b6. Strictly speaking, that's the English defense. Or you can play c4, b6. 
Um, so that's, that's kind of an English defense, and it becomes even more of one if you play e6 now. That's sort of the official English defense. It's the starting position of the English defense. And the St. George um, is a6. Uh, this is called the Owen defense. If you play b6 now, okay, this is called the Owen defense. Cyrus Lax Wall, I think, wrote a book about it recently. There have been a couple books. I think um, German Grandmaster, whose name I can't remember, it's, it's really silly, he wrote a book about it too about b6 generally. Bauer, Christian Bauer. And uh, okay, and then the St. George is this one, as someone pointed out here. And usually the, the St. George proper, actually you make that move too. So that's sort of the St. George. And we can look at those at some point, especially if you want to uh, send me a question by email. I'm not sure if people are necessarily interested in it right now. Okay, so let me look at something here. It says, what about bishop e3 on your bishop e5? Two inspiration, have it a check, double the pawns, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's probably true. Let's do that real quick before I switch back. And I won't be able to answer it completely because I won't know. But basically he's saying that in the mora, in this opening, um, you, maybe you want to just get the dark squares at all costs. Just play that move at all costs. And I'm sure that's a playable move. But it's, it'll also give black plenty of play. For one thing, it means that black has a chance to get castle pretty quickly. Now, there's ideas of knight b5 and queen d6, so we have to be a little careful here. My suspicion is we want to play a6. You don't have to, but it just looks like the right move. I'm not sure that queen b, knight b5 or queen d6 are that important, because you could play like this, for example. Hard to say. I, I don't know if white has enough for a pawn here, uh, but that's just me. I like having no weaknesses for black. Now that creates another weakness, but on the other hand, it looks very solid. And queen d6, you can probably just um, oppose, get castled first, and then maybe move this guy here. You can always kick it eventually. I'm a little suspicious of white's position here just because I'm not sure how he gets an attack going. It looks beautiful, all kinds of uh, dark square control, but I just don't believe it. That'll give us knight f5 at some point, and then queen b6. It could be, it could, could work, but I'm not too scared of this. It's a nice idea though, I like the idea. And as I say, you could just develop too. It's very hard to say, what if you just develop? I don't think this move is worth anything because of d5, right? That doesn't look very good for white. So white should just keep moving on. Play here maybe, bishop d3, castles, use the f file. There's definitely some attack here, but my experience is when these pawns haven't moved and are good defenders, it's gonna be pretty hard to, um, and there is a central majority, so, it, so D5 and E5 can be controlled too. Very good question. Uh, that was on, uh, actually that was on my message <laughs> to John L. Watson from, uh, from uh, Scaroth. Thank you. Okay, so um, let's go back and let me show you the next, um, let me show you the next, let me show you study. It's to show you why I think studies can be more instructive. Uh, that's maybe a poor generalization, but, but maybe just to show you a pretty study, if nothing else. Oh, this one. <laughs> this, is, this is kind of cool. Very simple, not famous, didn't win any prizes, I don't think, but it's very, very nice. I like, I like these simple ones. Okay, so the question is, uh, can white manage to draw this? He's piece down, and, um, you know, if the king starts coming up and just wipes out that pawn, it's, and also remember, bishop and knight can mate. So you can't just get rid of, um, you just can't, you can't just eliminate um, Black's last pawn and expect to win. So let's let's give it a whirl here. So the first thing he does is, um, for example, if he goes here, that's that's actually quite safe. For I'm sorry, actually, yeah, he would go 96, I think. Yeah. And the thing is, here's the kind of position you don't want to get. You don't want to get it where the pawn's there and can be defended by a bishop somewhere, because it's pretty easy to keep the knight away from him. So that's, that ten, that's now I'm not going to prove that, but there's a lengthy analysis that shows that that's a draw. So what he does to solve that is he plays here, and it looks so weird. First of all, it's always fun to make a knight into the corner move. But it also looks weird because it's going further away from the pawn, but it turns out you just can't do anything about this, 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 this. And here's where it's instructive. You have to know your endings. This is actually a standard ending. Let me show you this. Black goes here, white moves up, black comes towards the center, white gets a tempo, which is nice. Black plays somewhere, let's say uh, here. Attack, here, attack again. White defends, here. Black makes some sort of king move. 
here, and you have to know that this is a draw. So sometimes these studies are very uh, instructive. This is a draw. You, have to, you learn this position by doing this study. And this could come up in a real game, where you're aiming for this position or aiming for a king here, for example, some position like that, um, with the bishop obviously somewhere over here. But that's a draw, too. So, um, so, I, so, so this is a, uh, something you can learn something from. So instead of that, black simply moves the knight. And now this knight looks kind of stranded out there. But white plays back again <laughs> and attacks the knight. It's actually quite pretty. And now he has the same theme of marching up and attacking everything. And there's one more trick. Now, if the king comes up, it's still too slow. And you can follow that yourself, but it's the same idea. He's going to end up here with this king, with the pawn here. That's going to be a draw. Um, so, so black plays this, and you might think, okay, if he, uh, this looks like it's okay now, because after takes here, he's got time to bring the king into the center. And there's a long uh, Zugzwang kind of thing going on here. I don't know, uh, something like this. And you can imagine that, that black's going to win this, just because what can white do in the long run here? I'm not sure what the exact order is, but eventually uh, black can come around and win this pawn. Just have to take my word for that. So it looks like black won after all, despite our clever knight f7. But white plays this move. <laughs> very, very silly. Because he wants to take this one, and then we're back to that draw that we had before. So what can you do? If the knight, it looks like the knight coming down here might be kind of clever, but then you just take here. Um, if the bishop comes back, then you can simply take this. And if the knight comes up, you just ignore it. And if the knight goes here, you just come chase it. So, so what can you do? Uh, I don't know. Is there any other move? Oh, knight back, protecting that and hoping to win with the uh, knight versus bishop. But then, of course, white goes back again and wins one of the two pieces. Amazing problem, really. But I think also a little bit instructive. Um, so I don't know if that was any fun. But that's, that's an example of a study. And I have maybe one more example of a study if we don't get to other things. Why is the McKenna's floor variation of the English, sorry, I lost that, uh, of the English opening more well known to avoid the names of Indian? Why isn't? Oh, it's extremely well known, I think. Uh, I played it for years, and it's still played by quite a few people. Um, the answer to that would be if you, if, the, if you think at the very top people aren't playing it as much, that's because obviously because they think that it's not um, good enough, uh, that there's some good answer to it. I, can, I could tell you theory on it. I've even looked at it fairly recently, but that wouldn't really tell you that much because it's just the usual uh, complicated theory leading to all kinds of ambiguous positions. Um, let me get rid of this and go like that and go like that. Okay, uh, the legis we should at least know what we're talking about here. So here's the idea, normal English opening, and now if white plays here, black can play the Nims Indian, or the Queen's Gambit, either one, right? Or the Benoni. So it may not just be to avoid the Nims Indian, it could be to avoid anything here. Um, so the point is, in avoiding that, white will often play this move, that's called the McKenna's Floor Attack. And, um, Oh, good. We got another long, quite a long, long question coming up. This is the sort of thing, by the way, Thilo 28 fold at askiamwatson at chessclub.com might be better for because it's so long. But we'll take a look at it anyway. Um, but first, we're going to look at this. Okay, and, and black base has two moves. I would say this one has become more popular. Frankly, I think if you know exactly what you're doing, this very famous line here, and these moves are practically forced, unfortunately. Now, white can play like this, This is a, but this turns out to be a pretty harmless line. Although Black should know what he's doing. Fortunately, I played that way against Karpov, for example. Um, the main line at White Gambit's a pawn, which is to go here. And now this guy's isolated and can be attacked very easily. Queen c7. It can also be broken up with d6. So what White does is very aggressively grabs the center and then plays this move. Although there are some funny old moves once I played Queen a4 here. You can try Bishop f4, but this is the main move by far. And then it turns out black's best move is to actually force white to come into this square, this dark square. And that's because bishop f4 was kind of a threat, and queen a4 was kind of a threat. And even f4 can be kind of a threat. So the idea is get rid of this, and then play this move f6, because now the knight can come back at some point and attack the queen, or this knight can come up and attack the queen and get rid of it. 
very complicated for a long time. White's won an awful lot of games from this position, so in practice it's hard to play this. You'd have to have it all memorized. But if you look at the theory carefully, I think black is okay in this position. On the other hand, when you see it over the board with good players, you almost always, 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 always see um, d5. It's just amazing how, how much more popular this move is. And now, the old days, this would happen, and usually this move, and this kind of thing would happen. Um, and then white would play either knight f3 or d4. I think d4 still might give uh, white a slight advantage, but I don't, sw I don't swear that that's true. Obviously, everybody doesn't agree with that. And then black came up. Black used to play c5, and then he started playing d5 a lot more. And it's, it gets very messy. So that might be one reason, is that black's happy in that position. But um, then white recently has been playing this a lot more, and it just seems very convincing to me. I've looked at this a lot. Even though the blacks managed to draw some games, uh, white gets a very interesting line. Now, one thing to remember is that when you play there, the idea is not to win a pawn. If you try to win a pawn with this check, then these light squares are really nice, big, long diagonal, and that's a little bit weak. Even if it can be defended, it can be broken up, and then you have the e-file, too. So you can imagine that this, this position is a little difficult. I mean, Black's getting a nice lead in development here, right? He's got maybe, I don't know, bishop c5, stopping that. I'm not sure if that's the best move. But anyway, and then uh, pretty soon he's just attacking that pawn. And that gets very difficult. So you don't play there. What you do is you just uh, develop. You just play here. And it turns out that this position, you can also play knight f3, I think. But it turns out that this position, you know, Black still has some problems. It's a lot of theory, as usual. So I would be willing to play the Mechanis as white still. So I, I don't know what the... And, I, and people are still playing it. If you look at um, the top players, you'll see a fair number of games with this. So that would be my answer. Okay, the next one is um, white to move and checkmate in two. Wow. If I had this uh, in my other computer, or if, I had, <laughs> if I had this up on my other computer and I, I could just cut and paste those moves, it would be a lot nicer. Um, I don't think there's any easy way to put this up on the screen without playing through every move, and I'm not real thrilled about doing that. Thylophil28, I'll, I'll save this in the chat, and you can also send it to me by email, askiamwatson at chessclub.com, and we'll take a look at it. And, uh, did you play this game yourself, or is this just some theory that you enjoy? You can tell me that. Okay, I have two of the most important and strong tournaments coming up. I'm a specialist in 1b3 and bullet and blitz and know the plans very well. Do you think I can play this over the board? Sure, of course. Yeah, I mean, if you know the ideas, even if you don't know the ideas, you can play it. Yeah, it's a completely legitimate opening. White can get away with a lot more than black can. b3, uh, you know, Yubaba was playing it for a while. Um, and uh, there's whole books on this also, well, pamphlets anyway. And, um, and uh, it's a completely legitimate move. After all, if black can play b6 against anything, I guess white can play b3 against anything. So you can ask a specific question about that. In fact, if you want to, you can, uh, as I say, send an email to uh, askimwatson at chessclub.com or message me on ICC at John L. Watson, and we can talk about a specific B3 line. I would do a little survey, but I think <laughs> I would be losing, wouldn't be fair to the rest of the listeners. Uh, English Refugee apologizes for not seeing the whole show. We're well, just getting a little late. Um, that's fine. Um, ITD the game, Milman versus Fang. Okay, so Milman versus Fang, this is Joe Fang. Um, best game of the 21st century, <laughs> that's fantastic. Okay, send that to me, I'll, I'll try and look that up, and uh, we'll look, we'll show, maybe we'll show it next week, that'd be fun. And as I say, just send me an email, and then we can, uh, uh, with that or any other question. I've been getting fewer, fewer emails in the last couple weeks, I'm not quite sure why. Okay, let me show you the, another study. I think that would be fun to show you another study here. Um, I think it's a really beautiful one. Not as instructive as the other one, but you'll see. But it's still kind of real-world oriented. There we go. I mean, look at this. This is a position that could happen, right? Of course, it's not not likely to happen exactly, and you're not going to have this gorgeous a solution. But I think it's um, it's the kind of thing that shows what what's fun about studying, well, about studies, and how maybe they could be useful. Something like this might be useful to try to solve. Anyway, um, and there's infinite numbers of these. It's not like this is the best one ever. Now, if white plays bishop b2, it's just an easy draw. White's trying to win. I'm sorry. I should have mentioned white's trying to win. So that means that white has to play here. If he has any chance of trying to win, and obviously if black plays there now, you go here and there's no stopping the queen. So black is actually forced to play 
check. And maybe because we're getting short on time, I will skip all the crazy variations if white moves the king. Although that's quite easy. This one you got to check. <laughs> that's easy enough. And king b2 is not as easy, but it turns out that these checks, um, do I need to, uh, Oh, actually, I'm sorry. It can't be too good. It's simple. I'm glad it's simple. You have this move, and there's no there's no pin anymore. So you simply take the pawn, and it's a draw. So the, the answer is this very clever move, bishop here, which hits f8 again, which is nice. Now if the rook comes back, of course, we have bishop back again. So he has to take it. Check. And now white's threatening to queen and also threatening to just take this. And black has a very cute move here which is that check, only move. Turns out that if he plays here, you can play here. And now black's stuck. But after this move here, there's the nice idea that if you take it, uh, there's a check and the pawn falls. So white has to start running around. I'm not gonna obviously show you all the details. Everything loses, uh, everything else uh, is a draw. If you play here, it just turns out there's another check and black manages to continually harass the king effectively. Uh, you can get all the way down to rook d7 check and then just take the pawn. Uh, and king a2 is the same problem as before. So, yeah, if he takes it, we have this check, as we talked about. So that's the only move. And um, check, again, is the only move, because otherwise uh, the king just moves over and black runs out of checks. Okay, it's a cute little problem. So all white has to do is get his king out of the way somehow. And he does. I, I'll just show you. These are force moves. The only way to win, that's the thing about a study. It has to be unique, and this one's been checked many times. There's no busts. OK, so it looks like that's it. White got out of it. He's about to play check and win. But then there's this cute idea here. Because if king takes, you have bishop takes check, followed by king coming up. Uh, and that draws. So therefore, white plays that move. and. Um, I should probably mention, let me see that we have, uh, what else do we have? King here, you have this nice rook coming back, <laughs> and there's no way to queen the pawn. Um, for example, here, here, check, and the king comes up and wipes out the pawn. Uh, so king there doesn't work. King to f6 doesn't work because of rook g8. But king h6, amazingly, does work. Now you'll notice you can't give up the rook anymore. You can't play things like uh, this check because the king still won't be able to stop the pawn. So he needs to come up with something else, and he tries this move. Oh, and also this is interesting. Check, check, but white simply avoids taking, and the next move is checkmate, or close, good enough, wins the queen. Um, so the only move is this cute little move, stopping the, the pawn from queening. And it still loses, because white plays this nice little move, threatening this. And now if the rook comes over, we have checkmate. But there's still more to go, because black can play this move, threatening bishop takes f7. And if white queens, he simply takes. It's another draw. But check. Uh, and uh, we'll make a queen out of that, I guess. Uh, takes and checkmate. I don't know what you think of that, but I think it's a really, really nice, wonderful uh, move. Thank you for giving me that fan. The only problem is I'm on another computer. I'd have to, I'd have to get onto this uh, internet, cut and paste it, and throw it into, uh, throw it into ICC. So I think maybe, maybe I'll have to do that next week. Um, yeah, the yeah the fan is very useful, by the way. Um, yeah, it's quicker than recording every square, that's right. Fan is very useful in a lot of programs. Most, most chess programs will take Fan. So thank you, uh, English Refugee, for that. OK, um, anyway, isn't that, I, to me, that's a really elegant, wonderful problem. And it has, certain, uh, it has a certain amount of um, practical value, I think. I mean, even at the end there, this idea, this kind of thing about playing, playing this move here, that's kind of a nor relatively normal theme, believe it or not. Um, and um, some of the earlier ideas, too, perhaps. Um, so not horribly practical, but very beautiful and very, and I think very, very interesting.
I actually got some more problems. You know, it's not that late. We can throw up another problem if there's not another question. I don't know if there's another question. Let me, um, let me just see. Wow, I'm completely out of uh, order here, but that's the way these things work, I guess. Let me see. Let's see what I have here. What to actually do one more? It's too complicated. Let's see if I can do an easier one. Is there an easier one? 107. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you may have all seen this one, but this is kind of cute. So this is good. You'll like this. A good one to end on. Okay. Sorry, we didn't do our usual opening and answering of uh, looking at games thing, but th these are kind of fun anyway. So the question is, how the heck does White win this? And uh, as you might have guessed, it's going to start out with a discovered check. And it just turns out, as you'll see, that the only one that works is this one, away from the king. This is very pretty. And it's pretty obvious once you see it. In fact, you this is the kind of one you might have been able to solve by yourself. Uh, some of those others are pretty tough. And, um, okay, why does he go there? Well, if he moves the king up this way, he loses the queen. So this is just a simple white to move and win. Check. The king has to come back again because he'll lose the queen. Check. And uh, then the king, if the king goes over here now, there's this check, winning the queen. So it's a geometry problem. It's a really nice little geometry problem. So the king has to go back, and then this very pretty move. And black is in complete and utter zigzag. He actually can't move his king legally, and he can't move his pawn legally, which means he has to move his queen. And because the king is here, the queen can't go to these squares. There'd be no threat at all if the, king could, if the queen could go to any square. So it's one of those domination problems. There's a lot of domination problems. Remember when I showed that uh, study a few weeks ago where the knight dominated the rook? That was really beautiful. Uh, and here the king and the queen uh, and the bishop, are because the bishop's covering DA, are dominating the queen. So the queen has nowhere to go. Uh, maybe that square would be natural, but then there's the checkmate because it uses up the escape square. So I think that's a very, a very cute little one. Oh, I've got a question. A little late, <laughs> but let's do it anyway. Okay, so study books. Whoa, that's kind of a general question. Study books for, it depends what you need. We've talked about this a lot. Um, there are, uh, you know, tactics books, problem books, uh, middle game books. I always think people will benefit from looking at uh, books with games by great players is a really good, a good kind of book to look at. Uh, it kind of depends what your style is, what you're looking for, and what, basically what, what are you trying to study. Obviously it can't hurt to, there are a lot of good endgame books. The only thing about endgames is I think almost all the books are good, good enough to learn from. So there, I don't think there's any exceptional endgame book, except for the maybe super grandmaster, but for the average player, it's good. Not to quibble with me, three, not three. Oh, <laughs> so Jim set it up. Jim Tarzan, by the way, a very famous grandmaster, U.S. championship participant many times, and playing extremely well right now. Um, uh, so that's interesting. So he, he managed to set it up and look at it. So um, so we'll look at it next week. I'll, I'll throw it on there next week for everybody else. And uh, So I like that last problem because it's just a few moves, and it's just very elegant and, and very efficient. And that's, that's a study that has some, I think, again, it, it's, a geometry, it's a good geometry thing. And it's a, it is, again, a real game position. I mean, kind of position. It's the kind of thing where at least could happen. So it has sort of normal real game themes in it. So just studies like this. Well, that was the original question that I got. I don't know if you remember, but the original question is, will it do any good to uh, study chess studies? Will it help my game? And I quoted Kasparov about how much he loved them, and I quoted Levitt about why he thought they were good to study. I think it's an inefficient way to study. I, I really do. I don't think it teaches you as much as other kinds of studying. Uh, there, the, the reason that there were maybe, I'm hesitant about that, is if you enjoy studying and you won't study more boring things, um, then you should do it because any study is helpful. And studying, uh, it's just that I think you're better off studying things that could happen in, in you know, the real world. Not that this couldn't happen, but but uh, most of your study, I think, should have something to do with, you know, real, real games and real, real things that could happen in your games. Patterns, uh, middle game positions that are common, openings, positions that are common, great games by great players, the sort of thing that can come up more often. So I'm not a big fan, but he gave many reasons for doing it. And his main one was motivation. It does, I, I guess, expand your mind, but I'm not sure if that translates to over the board. I, I'm skeptical whether that translates to over the board. I think um, 
just my feeling. We uh, people can, uh, you know, chime in here and say that if they think I'm wrong about this, because I very well could be. Uh, it could be that it helps you in every way. One thing we know for sure: it can't hurt. It can't hurt to study any kind of chess, and uh, studies and problems are certainly part of the chess world. So, um, and and they are certainly useful. They help you concentrate. I just think other forms of study, if you're careful, will also will also help you. Um, never hurts, depending on your strength, it never hurts to do some amount, not too many, but some amount of tactical exercises or calculation exercises. Some book of problems, in fact, it's the best kind of book of problems, is one that has positional and tactical things that are mixed but doesn't tell you. It doesn't tell you what, what you're looking for. It doesn't say, look for the sacrifice or look for the pretty maid or something. So that it might just be that the solution to the problem is simply a really good positional move. I know my student Ray Chang wrote a book like that many years ago. It's a little small little book, and uh, and uh, very well received. Where where you just didn't, you weren't given a clue as to what you're looking for. You know, if you get a book of combinations, you know that what you're looking for is a combination, and that's not as healthy or useful as not knowing. So, so that's that's one thing to think about. I, th I think opening study, you know, everybody thinks it's overrated. I think in some ways it's underrated because when you study openings these days, you're looking at middle games, basically. You're looking at how to play the middle games that come from openings. And those overlap a whole bunch of different openings. Those have a ton to do with chess. So I think you'll find that like most top players, you're, you can learn a lot studying openings. Don't be shy. Don't let someone tell you, oh no, unless you study end games, you'll never be any good or something like that. And of course, end games are useful also to study. My feeling with end games is you're probably best off Make sure you learn the basic ones. But then after that, maybe you're in no hurry, unless you're getting an awful lot of end games in your, your own games, which is not true of most of you because of the time controls and, and level of play. Encyclopedia of Chess Combinations would be just fine. Yeah, that'd be a good uh, book if you're using books to study. There's also a lot of online tactics, so many different sites that will give you a thousand online tactic games. So that might be easier for you because they're a little simpler to flip from one to the next. I think Encyclopedia of Chess and Combinations is a fantastic book. Um, I always like Richard Palliser's combination exercises, but I think there are literally you know, 500 or more combination exercise books, and they're all probably pretty good. It's hard to write a bad one, <laughs> in my opinion. So, um, so yeah, those are good to study, but I wouldn't overdo it. I mean, if you start doing just online exercise, tactical exercises, or from a book, you're really limiting your chess education, and you'll find you don't necessarily play tactics any better over the board. I, I'm not quite sure why that is. I have thought about why that is, but it doesn't necessarily help your tactical play that much. It's just good practice for calculating and thinking, but um, don't count on it too much. Make sure you also study middle games and end games, and, and I think openings. I think you'll find that even studying openings will get you a lot of end game practice in, too, and it'll definitely get you a lot of middle game practice in. So. So that's not a very specific answer, but we have talked about this before, and maybe I'll do it again, just kind of go through some books I like and some online resources that I like. Okay, everybody, well, it's, uh, that, it's getting really late. I hope you enjoyed the problems, because that's pretty much all we got into in that one end game. Uh, but I uh, really enjoyed having you here. Good questions as usual. Very knowledgeable crowd. And I will see you next week.